This lesson is uh, has a lot of interesting facets and all. Uh, some things that uh, I think we've always conjectured about, and probably correctly, that uh, uh, some things maybe that the Bible doesn't exactly say. Uh, but also, this gets into uh, this business about Herod. And it led me to want to ask you the question, who happens to know how many Herods there are in the Bible? <laughs> okay, <laughs> no one's kidding this. And uh, I, I review this every year or two just because uh, it seems to me to help to know who the Herods were. Uh, I've actually seen the Herod uh, tomb in Jerusalem and it's nothing to brag about. But, uh, <laughs> well, it's nicer than some of the others that were around here, but be that as it may, there were six Herods. And a lot of times I'm thinking, how did Herod get from there to here? And what, what, what? Because uh, a lot of translations don't say which Herod it is. And it helps if you know. So I'm going to go quickly through the Herod. The first one, of course, is Herod the Great. And I don't think that as a person there was anything great about him, or probably any of the rest of them. But if you uh, take the little trip to uh, Israel that a lot of us have taken, uh, and you see all of the things that he built, there's so many things there that are still standing, that are still functional, still usable, that were built by Herod, and he was a great builder. He really was. And so uh, that, uh, he's also the one that uh, had all those little babies killed in Bethlehem. And so that wasn't great. That was plum sorry. Then there are his sons. Herod Archelaus, uh, and there's not a whole lot about him. He ruled from 4 BC to 6 AD as one of the patriarchs. They were there were four sons that uh, they divided Herod the Great business up into four things because of a lack of trust and, and a number of things intrigue that was going on in those days. Then there was Herod Antipas, which is the Herod that we're talking about today. Jesus called him that fox. And, uh, you know, people say, you shouldn't call names. Well, Jesus called him a name. You know? <laughs> uh, I didn't notice that. Usually, well, call him names. Uh, and, of course, he killed John the Baptist. And then there's Herod Philip the patriarch that ruled from 4 B.C. to 34, and he married Salome, which was Herodias' daughter. Of course, Herodias plays in our uh, story today. Then there was Herod Agrippa I, ruled uh, 37 A.D. to 44 A.D., and uh, that's the Herod that was eaten by worms. You remember if you read them over there in Acts. Uh, uh, the story about him, well, he's, he's that one. And then there's Herod Agrippa II. And we generally just know him as Agrippa from the way the Bible reads. Uh, he uh, started ruling in 50 AD and ruled until his death in 93 AD. And he is the Agrippa that said to Paul, almost without persuaders to me to be a Christian. Um, and we don't think, I think, of, in my way of looking at it, we still don't think of him as being a hero, but he was. Um, how many different phrases can you think of that people use to make a promise? I was fascinated uh, when I saw still a few years ago, there was this very, uh, uh, well, I don't know, very vital black lady that taught. And one day I saw her working on a student and she was trying to get him to do what she wanted him to do. And what she wanted him to do was what he needed to do. 
And uh, he said, okay, I will. And she said, pinky swear. And so they, they locked their little pinkies together. I, I've never seen that. <laughs> I've heard a lot of times since then. But uh, I thought that was kind of neat that she uh, was trying to get some good out of this kid and making him make a promise. And I don't know if he kept it or not. Didn't follow up on that one. Uh, we also have Cause My Heart and Hope to Die. That's the one that uh, I think I heard as much as any uh, growing up. Uh, sometimes we say, no matter what happens, my bond is my word. Well, I can assure you, and I know a fellow who used to say that a lot, and it never was true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's... Uh, Oh, and let's not forget this one. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Uh, You're dying. <laughs> and yes, you are dying. And we're all dying. <laughs> and we're probably going to have to wait for a while to be gone. But anyway, I might go first. So it, it's so easy to, uh, to make these kinds of promises. Uh, do you happen to remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about some of this? Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. And people ought to be able to accept your your words for some things. We had a fellow that did some a built a room on our house here just a while back. And he's a, he's a preacher, but he also is a builder. And I thought it was very interesting that uh, yeah, we had a contract, which you should have a contract. I highly recommend that. And you probably know that better than I do. But uh, I thought it was also interesting that he gave his word on some things. He said, yes, you know, yes, I'll do that. And I think he did every single thing he said he could do. Uh, and I think he is a man of his word. And don't you like find people who are like that? who keep their word, they do what they say they will do. Now then, uh, this story today, though, gets into that business of making rash promises. Saying things, uh, if you watched uh, any of the uh, Harry Potter films, Hagrid is always like, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and, uh, this particular Herod Antipas shouldn't have said what he said, but he did. And uh, it led to very unpleasant consequences. And you know, we can do the same thing. Uh, I think it's a little difficult to get some of this to be applicable to us today, but, but it is, really. Uh, especially those of us who talk too much. I put myself in that category. I know I can be quiet. Usually not. <laughs> and you get started talking, and uh, pretty soon you overlook your mouth and you, you said things. And, and when you're working on people's pianos, sometimes they're, oh, yeah, I can take care of that. And you get in the middle of it, and why did I tell them I can take care of this? I'm having a horrible time doing this, and I shouldn't have said that. And now I'm stuck with what I said. So the bad guy today. Uh, made a rash promise, and uh, I guess you all know that we're talking about uh, the death of John Baptist, and uh, it got made, it happened on account of uh, Herod making a promise that he shouldn't have made. <clears throat> uh, the guy that wrote this book that we're looking at things from, uh, Tells a big long story here about Mike and Frank. Mike and Frank, well, if you ever watched, uh, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, American Pickers. Well, uh, <clears throat> Frank got to bragging, uh, Mike got to bragging about how many oysters he could eat. And so Frank got tired of it and, and made him a bet he couldn't really eat. 72 oysters on the half shell, but if he did, he'd shake the gear off. <laughs> so he ate 72. And in the next scene, 
scene we're seeing Frank shaving off his beard and his razor goes outside his face, it's a tear coming down. <laughs> and it's kind of like another one of those rash promises. Now that might have been more for TV than it was actual or real. But it does kind of illustrate the point that we are way too often uh, saying things that we really, really shouldn't. But uh, during this time of the of John the Baptist and Jesus uh, in, the, in the beginning of the kingdom and their ministries, Herod Antipas was the teacher or the regional ruler of Galilee and Berea. And uh, Antipas had uh, apparently married King Aretas' daughter, like a lot of those marriages were, to create a good relationship with the Nabataeans. This was the deal. And uh, this, and it backfired later because <clears throat> Antipas wasn't very well disciplined. And during a trip to Rome, he fell in love with his half brother's wife. Now that never fares well anyway, but he just had to have her. And so uh, she finally said, okay, I'll marry you, but you have to get rid of this Nabataean wife that you have. You can't uh, keep her. And so he divorced her and in, in what somebody said was a not so great mood. And this, this is Herod, the not so great, of course, <laughs> the kind of room, but, And uh, so this uh, set up, well, she went home, and, and uh, all of a sudden the relationship that hadn't been too great anyway just totally fell apart. And uh, the uh, two territories got into a war. Uh, one with the other, and, and it, it was a total irritation to Rome because they had to send soldiers down there to get Antipas out of trouble because he had done, done this, uh, divorced this Nabataean wife that he had. And so uh, the decision to marry Herodias was not a great decision at all. It great. And uh, whether Antipas realized it or not, he was just getting himself in more trouble because she was about like Mary and Jezebel. She was a, a headstrong, uh, stubborn woman who was just as corrupt in, in heart and spirit as you can imagine. And uh, we'll uh, look at some things in Mark and Matthew where this is recorded. Um, it says, for Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, he did been saying it, it evidently said it more than once. And sometimes, okay, you already told me that that attitude when people start telling you something oh, that you don't, you don't respond like you should, then they tell you again, people like that can be so irritating. And this was terribly irritating to Herodias. But anyway, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias, can you believe this, had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she didn't have the power to do that. She wanted to. Can you imagine being a person that powerful? I don't like you, so you get sacked. I read about one of the queens in, in uh, England, and I should know which one, but I'm kind of foggy right now about it, uh, who wept over some of her friends, but they crossed her and she said, well, off to her head. <laughs> and so, you know, they lost their head, and, and she, you know, and it's kind of one of those, well, you shouldn't have said so and so to me, or you shouldn't have done this, or that kind of attitude, and, and had the power to do that sort of thing. Well, she wanted that power, and she wished she had it, of course, Adipus did have it. And I really think, this is just 
my idea about it, but I really think, now there's a lot of other people that share this idea, that she worked this out intentionally to get John because she was so angry at him. So, and it says uh, she wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. So John the Baptist made sure that Antipas, who has Jewish background, by the way, is not, is not totally what we think of as a heathen, uh, that he was in violation of God's law by marrying his sister-in-law. You can find some things about that in Leviticus uh, chapter 18 and 20. Well, with his half-brother still alive, such a marriage would be considered an adulterous and scandalous relationship among the Jews. And so this makes things uh, a little rough for Antipas because He's done this, and now he's got a group of people that are supposed to be following him that aren't so crazy about following him. It's all an adulterer. He's not, you, know, you look at politics today, and nobody pays any attention to any of that stuff, do really. they? Well, they did back in those days. <laughs> and so, anyway, Herodias had had enough of John, and she wanted to get rid of him because. He had the unmitigated goal to say that they should not be married. And uh, according to Matthew's account, Antipas also wanted to put him to death, but he was afraid to. Now, Josephus, you all know who Josephus is, don't you? Historian of that, of that era, who wrote a few things we know aren't exactly right because they don't agree with the Bible, but he wrote a lot of stuff that fits exactly. Bible, the way Josephus wrote on some of this, and he recorded that Antipas's concern was not religious, it was not about morality, it was political survival. How am I going to get out of this mess and survive? By the way, if you go ahead and read about Antipas and all the stuff that happened, that he didn't really survive, he got exiled along with the, uh, Herodias. But anyway. Uh, he wanted John ex executed because he feared his accusations would create a rebellion. And you know, Rome's already failed him out one. And you don't want to make Rome mad twice. So Antipas realized that he had a really dangerous political situation on his hands. And the attraction of the Jewish people to John created fear in him that an uprising might occur should he try to execute him. So he took a less fearful route and threw God's prophet into prison at Machiris to kind of stop John from talking. In other words, uh, cut off his account. <laughs> He's no longer on Twitter. He's not <laughs> going to talk to anybody because they, they cut him off. And this also keeps him safe from uh, Herodias. Uh, so, and you know, I keep every now and then seeing in relation to this Herodotus. And I was thinking, was she Herodias or was she Herodotus? Herodotus was a Greek historian. So it's Herodias that we're talking about. Okay. So it says, um, a strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod at his dinner dance. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her. Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? 
And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in uh, in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guest, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in the tomb. Mark 6, verse 29. So that's the story. You can wonder when we were actually going to get to it. Now, there are a number of things that get talked about here. One of them is uh, uh, Salome and uh, how do you dance in such a way as to please somebody enough to offer you up to half a key? But what kind of dance was this? Probably something they hadn't seen before, may not have seen before, but they really liked it. May not have seen it in that setting before. We're pretty impressed that she likely did some type of karate dance or suggested that. Well, and that was one of the things that was taught when I did it. We, we kind of assumed some things. Uh, and you just started reading commentaries on this, <clears throat> and practically all of them will point out that the Bible doesn't actually say that it was erotic in nature, but most surely it must have been. Uh, and you think of, of who was there at that uh, banquet and so forth, and uh, that would. Uh, be another indication. Everybody needs to really enjoy that. Now, some will bring up the idea that well, why would a mother, Herodias, allow her daughter to come in and, and dance like that, especially in those days uh, when they were even more loose morally than they are here now. She didn't know they could get loose and they <laughs> uh, so, are, are you sure? Right? Uh, because we've seen it before, and and they kind of argued against that thought, but uh, <clears throat> that that's where the conspiracy theory comes in, and that is uh, the idea that uh, she put her daughter in that situation to dance in front of Herod. To elicit his response, um, I will give you anything up to half my kid. Because you notice the girl is very surprised. Uh, Mom, what am I asking for? Uh, boy, did he surprise me. I don't think Mom was surprised at all. But she answered right away. That's for John the Baptist's head on a platter. We got to figure there's probably some uh, lot of wine involved too, but I would guess. Yeah. You know, I mean, so that they stupid the things and do stupid the things in those situations. Well, the theory is that she uh, she planned all of this. That, that he was a dupe. And I don't know that that's true, but you know, you get to look at the, the pages of, of, of scripture and it certainly makes a lot of sense that uh, she planned all of this and it all went according to plan. So uh, anyhow, uh, she did do the dance and he did make the offer. And uh, he uh, um, made the promise. And then he's upset when the request is made. Um, he wasn't happy about that, but because
because of his oath and the people that heard him, these are going to be people that heard him make that offer. Well, I guess I have to do this. And we're talking about a man's life. We're talking about an innocent man's life. And unfortunately, a lot of innocent people end up dead the same way. If there is some of the situations that you know, get into it in life. Most of us don't live in, in that kind of uh, atmosphere and so forth, but there are people who do. There are people who, who know their life is on the line, and I guess John did too, for that matter. So prison may have been for his protection, but it turned out it's not working because Herodias had a different idea. Uh, so the dance is done, and the uh, the uh, and he he feels honor bound now, or obligated to stick to the oath that he made to Salome. It doesn't really. <clears throat> Probably right, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, it might make sense because it was a public oath in front of the people who weren't impressed. But it wasn't his first lie. It wasn't Herodias' first lie. It, was, it slid off his tongue way too easily. It was a pattern. It's what he did. It's what they're finding. So it shouldn't be a surprise. Well, what could he have done different? Well, if he was accustomed to confessing his sin, <laughs> and may or may not have been. He could have said, "I really, I really messed up. I got caught up in the moment." But he wasn't accustomed to that. He already told his first wife. I, I don't know what their vows were, but he had already taken an oath with his first wife. Herodias probably took an oath with her first husband. He already broken at least those. But it, so we know it was. We know it wasn't their first wife. We know it wasn't their first time breaking an oath. We don't know how many other times they had done that, but it appears that it happened pretty readily, pretty easily. It seems to me that he might could have saved a little face, I don't know, by just looking at Herodias and saying, very clever, but I'm not going to do this. Um, if I have to go back on my word, I'll go back on my word because I uh, have enough principle about me that I am not going to do this and you're not going to corner me like that. And uh, But you also are admitting, and I was stupid. I don't think that word again. Uh, you know, I wasn't very smart. I, mean, the same thing. I shouldn't have shot off my mouth. But he did. Jerry, <clears throat> yeah. Even in even in my effort to convince someone from time to time, even if it might be even theological. Maybe maybe more times than not, it's a theological question. And, and you alluded to this earlier, you spoke this earlier. In my attempt to prove my point, I might go too far. I, I might borrow something from somewhere else to bring that to bear that if I think about it later, probably went too far. It probably really wasn't appropriate to do that. It was really easy to do. And when one is a leader, community leader, I guess it was, regional leader, I don't presume to know what pressures are on them to do the right thing to keep their own head, to keep their own job. And then when it's a pattern of your life, it's very difficult to say what you said. No, that, that goes against my principle. That, that would be very difficult. Well, and uh, in the position he was in, I think makes it even more difficult. But you, you and I both know people who just aren't going to, aren't ever going to budge and they're never going to back down and say, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know, they, they won't do it. 
And he may have been one of them. Well, it's really all about relationships because he he wanted those, however appropriate they were, relationships to work out. But even in the middle of doing what he did, it was what they were talking about this morning, he still, he ruined a relationship. Oh, yeah. it was, you know, he ruined a lot of things besides killing John the Baptist. But it, it, for me, it just really all boils down to either maintaining relationships or having improper relationships or maintaining a really good relationship. And he ruined all of them, effectively. Well, how can uh, pleasing others, which I guess is what you could call what he was doing, how can that be, and I think maybe you already answered this, detrimental though to our family, to other relationships, <clears throat> our work, our spiritual life, and, and our ability to, to show Christ to others? I think it can be terribly, terribly detrimental. Uh, we say, well, I don't care what others think. And sometimes that's said in the idea of uh, I'm doing what I'm doing and I don't care what people think. But uh, what really uh, I'm talking about here is it's just I'm very interested in the impression of others. And uh, if it causes me to say something that I shouldn't say, uh, I, I want to be good in that person. I, a lot of times, uh, we do ourselves down. Because I think some people are smarter than people are. You see that? People are just. Well, but he's not sitting in my mind. Herodias is a perfect artistic in the world. She is not only has she done this on purpose, don't tell me that he planned that party. She did. And she made sure there was enough good strong wine. She made sure that he was, she knew what set him off. She knew what he was say. And after he said it, she was his ears saying, you got those pieces here because I didn't go. You know, Rose is going to be a set and all these things you've got here. You can't do that thing. So she, she is playing Well, some might not agree, but I do. <laughs> I think that's a, a pretty fair assessment of, of what actually happened here. I have some questions that are they're written out here, and I'm not sure how good some of these questions are. This one says, what types of behaviors do some practice to gain the acceptance of those in the world? That is a good question. <laughs> but part of this answer in verse 19 is that Herodias had a grudge against him because of what he had said to us, that your, your marriage is lawful. So, in our world today, if you want to get in trouble, if a preacher wants to keep his job, he might not to tell people about their sin. He'll, he'll get you in trouble every time. We have a really good record of that right here. But unfortunately, we face that all the time when we convict people, we talk about their sin. That's not a safe thing to do. It's not a popular thing to do. But if they're not convicted of their sin, they're never going to get anything changed. They cannot be saved. One cannot be saved until one knows that makes sure the law. Right. And so it is It is part of our job. It is part of what we do. It's likely, because John the Baptist probably really didn't care much about what people thought based on his earlier record we have him. He probably wouldn't very, he probably didn't stutter whenever he told yeah. him. The way they should be living. Yeah, you can you can stumble into this. And I know you can because I did. I preached a sermon um, several years ago, and a fella came out and he just looked at me very seriously and he said, "I don't know how to do that." 
the man was completely out in the left field and there was no reading it because it's not in the Bible. And that fairly led to that discussion uh, eloquently in a lot of ways. Well, there's something else that's gone that did this and that the conscience. This hurt Antipas' conscience. Because later on he talked about, oh yes, John the Baptist, the man I beheaded. He uh, had a concern about that. Uh, do you think maybe there's a connection between rash promises and violating our consciences? What is a conscience anyway, and what's it good for? Or is it good for anybody? A lot of people don't think it is. Conscience is what keeps one from jumping off the cliff. It does not keep one from going to the edge of the cliff. But it should be one that keeps one from going too far. Um, well, you know, uh, you can uh, recall the toe, it was hard to kick against the go. Uh, and it's talking about conscience. Some people <coughs> are really bothered when they do something wrong, and they know that what they did was wrong. And your conscience may not be well educated. Uh, conscience is, you know, Somebody said, let your conscience be your guide. And in a sense, maybe you kind of have to, but you need to educate the conscience. You need to know what's right and what's wrong. You need to know what you should be doing or should not be doing. And then it ought to it ought to hurt when you do the wrong thing. And uh, Herod's conscience. Uh, he, he felt some guilt and some sorrow. And that's what he got for compromising his conscience. And you have one and I have one and uh, I hope that our consciences are active. That if we do something that's wrong, that it hurts. Uh, I can remember something I said one time, and I don't want to repeat it. But I remember something I said one time, and it just didn't say. I realized that I've hurt somebody that I love very much. And you know, you can apologize and all of that, but you still said it and it still hurt. And, uh, and it, can, it can hurt your conscience for years. We really do need to watch the kind of promises that we make. Any other comments you want? I would just say on that, even if the other person's forgiven you, I'm saying you say to them, and they've gone on and hasn't even bothered them. Like, yeah, I mean, I've been that. Like, it just you can, it can eat at you for years and you wasted time. And it's so hard to give yourself. Yeah. yeah. What, Pierce? I didn't think anything about that. That <laughs> <laughs> <I> wasn't you. <laughs> Thanks for your comments.